Hello and welcome to Aston University's coverage of COP26, part of Aston Originals. You can follow us on Twitter at Aston Originals. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube as well. But we've beamed in uh, live to Glasgow to join Dan Taylor. Um, Dan, how is it going to begin with? What's it like up north? Uh, it's cold, Sam, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. Um, but it's also really, really great to be uh, here in Glasgow. Um, we're at the Ramshorn Theatre, which is where we're running our Super Gem Fishbowl debate uh, later. Um, and we've got uh, cameras being set up to live stream it, and we've got uh, lots of chairs. And um, I'm surrounded by images of innovation that have been put on by the University of Strathclyde, which you can see in the background here. Looks absolutely awesome up there. Um, not too far away from that fishbowl event. For anybody who wants to watch it, we will be live streaming it here. But if you have signed up via uh, Eventbrite, um, then obviously you can go and watch it um, wherever you like. And just tell us about what will be going on through that live stream event. So for the fishbowl this afternoon, we're going to be exploring different perceptions of net zero energy systems. Um, and that's through the generation of renewable energy how we're delivering it to people, um, what should we should really use it for, and then also interrogate what people think um, the UK government should be doing uh, to develop net zero energy systems for um, for the future. And so we're looking at solar, offshore renewables, energy networks, bioenergy, hydrogen and fuel cells, and energy storage yes. as well. Um, I mean, those are the highlights. What are the highlights of the highlights for you? Um, I think really that the fact that we've got all of the Supergen hubs here to take part in the debate is fantastic. Um, I think we're all aware that there isn't a, really a silver bullet for net zero energy. Um, we're going to need a host of different technologies and systems. And I think all of the research that all of the hubs are doing um, is crucial in that. So I think it's going to be really interesting to hear what um, our diverse group of um, stakeholders that we've got coming along to the event today what they really think too we've got people from the finance background we have people from the local council uh, we have people from consultancies we have various academics um, and students from a uh, even a student from denmark who's part of their green students movement um, so there's a, there's a wide variety of people coming uh, so obviously this is the, the highlight of, of cop 26 because you're there and you're enjoying it but what's the mood been like uh, in and around the city have you had a chance to experience any of it yet it's actually been it's quite quiet in the center because um a lot of it is blocked off for cop itself um but there was definitely a buzz when we got off of the train this morning um in the station when we came out into glasgow central station and, and there were cop 26 branded banners um, all over the place and posters thanking you for traveling by train um, so yeah it was it's quite something and I'm just showing a tweet um, from Professor Patricia Thornley um, she says COP26 shuttle bus from the station was so efficient security checks are well organized so many smiley people in the green zone what, what's the green zone so the green zone is a um, an area of, of COP where they're having different exhibits such as the COP26 Universities Network Stand, which the Bioenergy Hub are um, exhibiting on today as we speak. Um, and that's within the Glasgow Science Centre. So there are lots of different universities there, lots of different um, companies promoting what they're doing and promoting their activities in relation to COP26. So, I mean, the answer on everybody's lips is going to be, how did you get to Glasgow? Uh, so last night we, uh, we took the sleeper train from Euston. Um, and I've got up here this morning, so I've gone to sleep in London. And I've woken up in Glasgow, um, and it's 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 quite something. Um, I think I might be suffering from a slight bit of motion sickness following seven <laughs> or eight hours on a train. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it was really exciting. I haven't been before. So. It's one of those, isn't it? I mean, we we did a transport video around um, COP26 uh, last week, and obviously Transport Day is next week on the 10th. And I think this just highlights a little bit how bad the infrastructure is in this country, that you had to go to London to then travel to to Glasgow. And yep. and it's, it's taken you a very, very long time to do that. Yeah, it it felt counterproductive to go south to go north um, coming from Birmingham to London and then upwards but um, the accommodation situation here has been incredibly difficult with um, so many attendees obviously coming to Glasgow and being excited for COP26 um, 
so it just made sense that we would sleep and move at the same time so um that's i'm actually going to be catching the sleep on the way back down tonight because i don't have anywhere to stay in glasgow so. <laughs> right okay yeah so it's going to be a very very long sort of 24 hours for you isn't it um we spoke on on the video that we did for Aston Originals uh, last week and what your hopes were. Um, you said during that that it has to work, COP26. Um, are you feeling a little bit, or, bit more optimistic now that you're sort of in amongst it and, and you've seen it working? Um, I'm not sure I do, no. Um, I think I haven't been as close to the blue zone or where any of the real negotiations are happening. Um, so even though we're in Glasgow, it can feel quite distanced. I suppose you've got a lot of um, security and, and things like that that, that keep um, the general public away from a lot of that uh, from a lot of that space. And I think that's one of the key points that has come out in the past few days is that a lot of the civil society movements and protesters and young people especially um, have been protesting in Glasgow and not really got close to any of that um, and have uh, sort of being potentially ignored by world leaders but i think their voices are, are really important and they're trying to be heard so i think more power to them perfect well dan we are moments away of course um from that fishbowl event so i'm going to let you go and uh take your seat <laughs> and, and i suppose now do you get you get to enjoy it now don't you because um it, you're not you're not taking part in it per se but you'll be going yeah. around taking some photos and and hopefully enjoying what's being heard yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of work has gone into this and I really appreciate the work and the support I've had from the colleague, my colleagues at Aston as well as colleagues um, at the other Supergen hubs and, of course, all of those that are coming to participate today and are physically here. Um, it's really exciting to be doing a physical event in, in COP when much of it is also virtual, um, as we are now. So, of course, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. Hoping it, I'm hoping it will go really well and I'm excited for it. Well, let's hope so. Well, um, let's cross over live then to the Fishbowl event and say goodbye to Dan Taylor. Thanks for catching up with Aston Originals, Dan. Thank you, Sam. These new technologies for energy supply. Our role as Supergens is to provide that research leadership for, for UK research. And we interpret that as being about connecting people and inspiring people in their research. So we're connecting together uh, the academics together with uh, industry, who will translate the research into practice, and with policy makers, and also with the general public. Um, and we work across disciplines, and we take a whole systems approach to our, uh, our investigations into the development of uh, new energy sources. So we're not just thinking about the technology, but we're also thinking about how they interact with the environment they operate in, and also how they're going to be utilised by society. So we're working across disciplines. Um, and as part of our programme, as well as connecting people together, we're looking to make sure that the workforce is sustainable. So we each have programmes of research or programmes of activity to support our early career researchers uh, and uh, people who are fresh into their careers, looking to, uh, to be inspired into working into these areas. And we also have a focus on equality, diversity and inclusion um, to make sure that we are supporting underrepresented groups to, to join and to get involved in uh, the energy sector uh, more generally. So I'll hand over to Patricia now. Okay, so you've just heard how important it is to us to connect with industry, policy and the wider community. So we're better to be than Glasgow this week on Energy Day at COP26. Most of us have been over at the Green Zone this morning. We have seen the huge enthusiasm that there is across a whole range of people with widely differing views of what our energy future should look like and we wanted to put this event on today to try and capture some of those different perspectives in the mind here but also so that we recorded it we're live streaming it but that we have a record today at least of what the mood's like in the room cop 26 what are people doing are we doing enough does the energy system look like it's evolving in the direction that we really wanted to be heading so I'm really looking forward to this. We've been planning this for such a long time and yeah, hoping that we get some really good perspectives in it. Thank you, Patricia. Great. We sort of places with Tony. We do, don't we, if that's all right. <laughs> Brilliant. And I should have realized I, realize I should have introduced myself. Um, my name is Steve Connor and I'm a facilitator. Straight into how we run a fishbowl without telling you my name. How rude. Um, okay, so now we're going to have a brief, I'm saying brief, I'm looking you in the eye. A brief introduction to those six hubs that you just heard about. Um, so what I'm going to suggest 
Patricia, if, if you can start mm -hmm. bioenergy, and then when you're done, if you don't mind swapping this out, uh, and we'll go full circle and come back to you. So, Patricia, sure. Not often that bioenergy gets good first, but here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little victories. It, it is. So, so, bioenergy is about taking CO2 that's in the atmosphere, turning it into plants and trees, then they're naturally, and then taking that and turning it into things that are useful. A lot of that can be energy, but we can also turn this into products. We have, in the form of trees and plants, the only renewable carbon atoms on the planet. And we've got to be really careful about how we use those. As we move towards 2050, that means being even more careful than we are today. And I really see bioenergy as a management exercise in shepherding carbon atoms out of there, down to here, and then working out what useful things we can do with them. It's also the only renewable which is inherently storable that we have in good supply in the UK. And um, it is absolutely fascinating because it has such a wide variety of interactions with land, with air, with people, all the way along that supply chain. So it's hugely controversial, it's hugely interesting, and we love working on it. So my name is Sarah Walker, and I am from the Energy Networks Hub. Um, we're aiming to help deliver a just transition to net zero. And um, in terms of the work that we're looking at, we've been talking to our community and we've run some workshops and I've got some key challenges to share with you that the community have identified. So on the technical challenges for networks, the electrification of heat and transport means that new technologies will be connecting to the network and some technical solutions are um, very early days, so we're not quite sure how they're going to interact. But we certainly expect that network architecture of the future will be more complicated. In terms of social challenges, we've identified the need for the disadvantaged to be part of the decision space. It's very important to have inclusive, accessible messaging about just transitions and about the role of networks and to think about the burden of cost, who it falls on. And on the market side, if we've got lots of renewables, lots of heat pumps, that's potentially lots more organizations and individuals wanting to be part of markets. And markets have not been designed or set up to enable millions of participants. So market change for networks in the future and who leads on that is not clear. Thanks. Hello, my name is um, Sean Dutton and I'm here representing the Energy Storage Bus Supergen. Um, so as Patricia has already hinted, as we move to renewable energies, we also need to think about how we store the energy so that we can, we can use it when we want, not when it's generated. And so as part of that, we need to think about how we store, how we store it. And this could be electrochemical energy storage, such as batteries or super capacitors, or it could be larger scale applications such as compressed air, um, liquid air, or um, flywheels. And so within our network, we're thinking about how do we do that? How does that integrate within the network with different types of renewable energies across both small and local scales? Sure. Wider scales. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Henry Jeffrey from the University of Edinburgh, and I'm one of the co-directors of the offshore renewable energy supergen led by Deborah that we've heard from earlier. I'd just like to start by giving some, some context, and the context I'm going to give is that the IE roadmap for um, meeting net zero by 2050 showed quite clearly that we can meet the 2030 targets with technologies that exist, but we really need emerging technologies to be developed to meet that gap between 2030 and 2050. And all of the technologies that we're hearing about today are meeting that goal, so it really shows the importance of the Supergen programme and delivering net zero overall. One of those technologies, of course, is offshore renewable energy. With those unfamiliar, that's floating offshore wind, wave and tidal energy that we focus on within the Supergen programme. And within the Supergen programme, we've done analysis in collaboration with the IEA that with the right policies in place at the right time, we will be able to deliver a quarter of the UK energy mix by 2050 from offshore renewable offshore renewables, as well as delivering nearly 80 billion um, to the UK economy. So that means that offshore renewable energy not only plays an important part in delivering net zero, it plays a really important part in delivering the just transition with those high quality jobs, literally
the howling com communities, as well as playing a role in balancing the overall network that we heard earlier is, is so important. So the, the UK is a leader in offshore renewable energy. Um, we need to maintain that lead. We heard, heard at the beginning of this week from uh, Business Secretary Quasi Quartan about the importance that we need to have on domestic sovereign technology and reduce their reliance on overseas supply. And I think all of the technologies that we hear about today are able to play a real role in doing that. Hello, I'm Tony Rascoli from Durham University, and I'm going to talk to you about hydrogen. So, uh, hydrogen uh, has had uh, many full storms. Uh, I've been working in hydrogen for about 30 years now. Um, and it's now actually moving from an increasing uh, momentum phase uh, into uh, implementation and demonstration phase. Um, so I, there's uh, IEA uh, Global Hydrogen Review that's uh, recently come out, which actually indicates uh, an increasing, a six-fold increase in the demand for hydrogen. Um, those that are working in hydrogen they really see that there are uh, three challenges, and it's demand, demand, and demand. Uh, we need to actually uh, increase the opportunity for the utilization of, of hydrogen. Um, there's set to be a massive increase in demand from uh, the uh, decarbonization of the industrial clusters, um, and also an increasing demand in transport that's linked to clusters because uh, Within those clusters, primarily, that's where hydrogen is going to be produced. Um, there, you have that interaction with freight movement and shipping. And so, therefore, there will be this transition over to uh, linking those, uh, those sectors together. Um, and also, in the um, uh, power generation side of things, in terms of providing dispatchable power, um, hydrogen is seen as a a very good um, long-term storage of energy um, and therefore we can offset the intermittency of uh, offshore wind, uh, renewables uh, like PV as well, um, but also then to balance the seasonal demand between supply and, supply and demand. Um, so to say the, the, the main challenge now is to build up the demand and also build up the supply of uh, low carbon hydrogen. So that's hydrogen from uh, electrolysis of water, uh, green hydrogen, um, but also blue hydrogen uh, from a point of view of reforming natural gas and integrating that with carbon capture and storage. Thanks, great introduction. Hi, yeah, so I'm, I'm Sam Shrex, the University of Cambridge, and I'm representing the Super Solar Hub right here. Um, and so, so we just heard the International Energy Agency has you know, put out their report in May saying that um, by 2050 we're going to need uh, around three, almost three quarters of our power supply would be from the renewables and solar would be kind of a major role in that. Um, and it's a very exciting time for solar because we've, we've seen the cost of solar, photovoltaics in particular, drop in price. Uh, the, the cost of electricity from solar has dropped down by a factor of 100 since 1980 and another factor of 10 since in the last decade. That's really, really exciting. Um, we now have close to a terawatt of, of solar photovoltaics um, deployed globally, and that, that's fantastic. But the reality is we, we need we need to be deploying around a terawatt per year, um, at least by the end of the decade. So this is, we're going to do a huge ramp up how much solar there is. Uh, and the current technology, which is silicon, is, is going to take us a long way there, but won't take us a whole way there. We need new technologies, new materials um, to support this and, and to really roll us out towards um, the terawatt per year level that we need. Um, so in, in terms of the super solar hub, the, the work that goes on, there's a lot of work going on to, to reduce the cost of silicon, um, the, the current technology. Uh, there's also a lot of work in developing new technologies, new materials, such as halide perovskites and bin film, but it's that tax, which can be a lot cheaper and deployed in, in different ways as well than the traditional solar. Uh, and there's also a lot of work in, in characterizing the stability, longevity of these, these cells, uh, and also systems approaches to solar. Thanks, Sam. Wonderful. Right, so we've had our introductions to the six hubs, um, and now we're going to go into actually having our substantive debate. Um, I'll run through the chapters we're going to cover over the course of the next um, hour and a quarter now. 
Um, and then just so you can have a thinking that's two of you to leave, if that's all right. So um, we're going to cover four main chapters of this conversation. Um, the first chapter is coming back to what we literally just started with, which is how do we generate energy in a net zero world? Um, what should the mix be, um, uh, and what are some of the challenges, advantages, disadvantages, and all of that. So that's chapter one. Then we're going to move on to how do we deliver that energy mix to the public, and what are the, what are the implications there? And that might be everything from some of the stuff that Sarah was talking about, a just transition, through to acceptability, feelings of control over energy, all that sort of stuff. So that's chapter two. Um, chapter three, uh, of our conversation is going to be about the utilisation of that energy. How do we use it? Uh, and what are the implications? What do we need to think through? Uh, are there any priority sectors that we should really get to earlier? And Tony, in terms of hydrogen, you were starting to pick up on some of that. Um, and then our final um, chapter for the conversation is what does the UK need to do to make this net zero energy system happen? That's both uh, obviously major systemic changes, but also anything that impinges on policy as well. So our final bit of the conversation is, uh, it's a cheesy thing, it's a big helicopter view, it's how do we make this actually happen? So that will be the final sort of concluding chapter. So those are the four bits we're gonna run through. Um, but in order to make this start, this fluid start, I'm going to ask for two volunteers from the inner circle. Who feels? Tony, you're a good man. Sean, thank you. So we've got two empty seats. So I'm gonna ask one member of the audience to join us in the inner circle, uh, as we talk about energy generation. So who can I call upon? I'm not actually just swivel right around, and I'll see you after that, right? Yeah. Um, so we've got our four initial speakers. Uh, I'm gonna kick us off and just ask us to start this conversation. Uh, but the rules are, if any of you want to join the conversation, or if any of our speakers say something that you'd like to respond to, rather than hands in the air, or wait for a Q&A session or somebody to come around with a moving okay. mic. Um, <laughs> I need you to sit in that chair over there, okay? And you can do that literally just like you started. So the chair is open. The only rule is, if somebody sits down in that chair, I need somebody from the inner circle to leave. Okay, fabulous. So our first chapter for this conversation, um, and Martin, maybe because I knew right, you might like to start with, actually, um, is how do we generate energy in our net zero world? And the, the four prompts I've got in that are, um, obviously, what mix of sources should we be talking about? What should we dial up, dial down? Are there any disadvantages or advantages that we really want to highlight in that mix? Um, uh, and the issue of storage is in this, gen uh, this sort of generation piece, and how do we store energy? So we might want to come back to that. Uh, and is there anything we really want to dial up? Do we want to grasp Patricia's challenge and make more bioenergy in the mix. Um, and some of you might want to jump in on that. So if we want to kick us off, Martin, can we start with you? What's your view on this? What should, what should the generation Well, I mean, I represent the Renewable Energy Association. And ever since we started that, um, we've been looking across a range of technologies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, really to begin with, we were focused on the development of those technologies. Now we're interested in not specifically those, but in how you solve the problems of getting it into the market. So it's moved from the issues of technology to the barriers that exist to getting it in. As far as how are we going to generate the, uh, the, the energy, then the reality is renewable energy is by definition distributed, and therefore it must be a distributed system that applies the most appropriate technology for a given area, given climate, given set of circumstances. So to come out and say it's <coughs> got to be solar or it's got to be offshore wind is not in, in our view necessarily the right way to do it. It is about thinking about exactly where you are and what you're going to generate. Alongside that, is the fact that probably more than we have done before, we need the interconnectedness. Because we're going to start, start looking at not only what happens in the UK and various regions of the UK, we are going to have to shift energy from areas where it's generated at a particular time. And it, you may have big 
shifts between countries or regional use. So way back we were looking at a European supergrid. That sort of thing is going to be necessary to make it happen. And then, of course, the final thing, which in many respects I think we've been too slow on, is storage. And the storage is not just about batteries. In fact, we're creative. If we concentrate on nothing but lithium, because it happens to be the technology that's there at the moment, then you can argue that that is not really the right answer for grid scale, because we need the high energy density that you have within lithium with, um, for electric vehicles, etc. So again, it's going to be a case of pulling on the various technologies there, being much more granular in um, what's appropriate in different places and, and supporting those solutions and bringing them into the web. I suppose that overall, if you think of the energy system, the, transmit, the transition that is occurring now is very similar to the transition that occurred in the communications and da data comms way back. We are going from very monolithic um, uh, approach, which is big, big power stations and lots of people sucking on it, to much more of a web. And, and that's where we're heading. And I think the business models will start to do that as well. But anyway, that's, so I haven't answered it. <laughs> so here's your one answer. There is that's not an answer. That's the approach. So why we uh, right to the run technology, run yep. right run technology, exactly. Yep. Who wants to come in on that tomorrow in the circle? If somebody wants to join, please do. I'll come in on that, maybe. So um, looking at the Northeast, which is where I'm based, about 20% of our emissions are from electricity, about 40% from transport, and 40% from domestic and industrial, all those things lumped together. Um, and so sometimes we talk quite a bit about where should the energy for the electricity system come from, but we need to remember how much of our energy is actually in the form of fossil fuel for various forms of heating, heating in the home or heating for industrial processes. Um, and so the energy currently for that is a lot of fossil fuels, it's oil and it's um, natural gas, and we need to move away from those carbon-based fuels and find alternatives. So alternatives like biofuels, alternatives like hydrogen, alternatives like electrification of some of those heating loads is, is really important. Um, and of course, that then changes the nature of what we need for storage and what we need for networks. Um, and the service that the end user gets potentially is different as well. So it's all interlinked. Mm. When we talk about how is energy going to be made, decisions there affect how energy gets moved and how energy gets used. Thanks, Sarah. We've got a new participant. Can you tell us your name? Hi, I'm uh, James Nash uh, from the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm doing a PhD in Wynn. Um, um, I've kind of been thinking over the past few months about um, something, and it's, it's more that we've essentially always had storage, and we've always used storage for a long period of time, just in the form of chemical fossil fuels in our vehicles. And if we're going to transition to electric vehicles and electrifying the system, we're probably always going to have those vehicles connected to the grid in some form or another, or for the majority of the time that they're in anybody's possession. You know, you're going to go home, you're going to plug your car in, it's going to charge overnight. And so with the demand curve, you have this, this, this big peak when everybody comes home and they put the kettles on, they made a cup of tea and they get in. And if they have their vehicle full of energy, which it likely will have been because they likely won't have been driving throughout the day, then you have in itself an energy storage consistently for a lot of the time. And if you have distributed systems like solar on company routes or individuals' houses, then you don't have to deal with a lot of the transmission issues because it's the, the generation is often located where the storage is and the storage is then moved to the, the, the location where the individual uses that power. So you don't end up with a lot of these issues. And that's just, I guess that's something I've been thinking about recently. I think it's an opportunity. Thanks, James. And I guess, sorry, just lastly, I yeah. also wanted to say, um, I think one of the other issues that we have with lithium mining is that it doesn't deal that well with um, high cycling rates. I mean, it's getting better, but I feel like one of the kind of issues that we're going to have to deal with is the fact that we probably need to find a different battery or at least make lithium better. Um, 
that. So yeah, that's good. Thanks, Can I pick up on that? Sam, yeah. yeah, so th I mean, I absolutely agree that, uh, that electric vehicles are very good storage vehicles. I think the other issue with the UK is with renewables is, of course, you know, we have, for example, solar, there's a huge discrepancy in when we generate the sun across the year and also across the day. Um, one of the really interesting things I think for solar is thinking about putting them into electric vehicles, actually on the roof, roofs of electric vehicles, and actually using them to generate you know, while the cars are out. You can boost the range and, in fact, fully charge the vehicle in this way. And this is something that some of the new materials can enable them, the lighter weight, high performance materials. And there's a lot of interest actually from carbon factors vehicle manufacturers for them. Um, so I think that's a very a, a, a paradigm shift in how we think about solar rather than just thinking about it as a you know, plug-in solution. Um, it, it can also be more dynamic. Thanks, Sam. Excellent. Tony, you've rejoined us. Yeah, so talk. I thought it'd be remiss of, to, not to point out that you, you don't generate energy, you convert it. Um, so, um, but it was linking to the, the, the point about um, uh, vehicle to grid, for example, the form of uh, storage. Um, that won't solve the seasonal storage issue and this disparity between summer and, and winter. Um, so uh, we need we need solutions for long term storage. Hydrogen is a, a plays a, a can play a particular role in that area. And that's really important. Great. It's one question for me for everybody and. And oh, while I'm starting, I'm going to the carbon management team at Buzz City Council. Good, good to meet you. Okay. Um, one question for me is because we are in a climate emergency and rapid decarbonisation is you know, right at the forefront of everybody's minds as quickly as possible. In terms of the generation of energy, is there any trick we're missing? Is there anything that we need to be making more of? Um, uh, are we are we focused in the right areas? That's one thought that I had. But Andy, you joined the circle. What, what do you mean? Just pick up a couple of previous points. We, we're we're doing a vehicle to grid um, uh, trial at, at our offices just across the road here in George Street. And I'm so happy to talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of solar because it's um, it's predictable um, and, and reliable even in in the UK. But it has to be part of a, a wider energy mix mm -hmm. and um, you know, the, the, the kind of lo locality and, and seasonality of Renewables means that it's, it's one of a, a number of uh, technologies we have to consider. You know, on windy days we get wind, but on sunny days we get sun. But you know, the two aren't always going to operate at the same time. So, so that, that energy mix is important. But one of the things we haven't talked about yet, and this is one of the both barriers and opportunities, is, is the, the role that people play. Mm -hmm. um, like never before, people are going to have to be educated in where their energy comes from and how they use their energy. So that seasonality. And, and those sort of day-to-day -day, um, variances of energy is something that are things that people are going to have to be cognizant of. You know, if it's a very windy day, that's the time to charge the vehicle or run, run the washing machine or whatever it may be. So whatever system we employ, um, the, the fact that it's not going to be a linear system like we currently have mean that the consumer is going to have to be far more aware that, than ever before. And that, that's a huge issue because, you know, generally speaking, we're, we're ignorant. We're ignorant to the issues and we're ignorant to the opportunities as, as, as a general populace. But um, I think that that's a real opportunity if we can start getting that information out. And that begins to mitigate the need for so much storage. You know, if we can change people's behaviors, change when they do th and how they do things, that significantly mitigates how much reliance we have on, yeah. on energy storage. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. That's a really good contribution. I'll let Deborah come in first and I'll come to you then. Uh, thank and these vacated quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I don't think I introduced myself. So I'm Deborah Greens, a professor of ocean engineering at the University of Plymouth and leading the Supergen Offshore Green Energy Hub. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things. First of all, I think using renewable energy really does connect us much better as, as people to, to where our energy comes from, from our electricity comes from. But that's not new. So we've recently got solar panels uh, PV on, on our house. And so we do our washing when it's sunny. But we've always done our washing when it's sunny because we put it, we hang it out to dry when it's sunny. So we've always had a connection uh, with that. And so I think it's just reinforcing that with our renewables. And the other thing about uh, renewables is they are naturally variable, of course, as we've heard. So we need to think about long term storage for seasonal effects, uh, but also shorter term storage and whether that's storage in, in the car or other battery storage or other solutions works as well. 
But the other thing is that we need to have an energy mix, a better renewable energy mix. So that's why it's so valuable to have solar and wind and have wind and tidal stream and wave energy, which are emerging uh, new technologies which haven't got to the same stage, but we need to keep them in the mix because by 2050, we can get some natural balancing occurring through the, the, uh, the, the, the variability, the different variability of each mm -hmm. of those sources. Excellent, brilliant. Tony, I'm going to come to you, and, yeah. then, and then I'll introduce our three participants. It was just a quick Thanks, point Tony. in that I have an electric vehicle that has the capability to to do vehicle to grid. My provider has provides that opportunity, and it's kind of this this thing about um, where you get the, the the public involved and having that confidence. I mean, there's still range anxiety range anxiety with electric vehicles, but when you're actually sharing your storage with with somebody else and you've got uh, limited control over that that's that's going to be quite a hard thing to yeah. to get over it's, it's okay for somebody that's like me working in the energy sector but for the general public i think that's going to be uh, it's got to be a lot of education right i'm going to keep some thank you so much Tony. i'm going to keep some the general public in a second we've got three new people this is even more exciting fishbowl than i thought it was going to be um, <laughs> so let's start with Names first, and then we'll kick off. So, you are? I'm Luke Cannon. I'm studying uh, resource efficiency at the University of Cambridge. Hi, Luke. Thanks. Jonathan Skirlock. I'm Chief Advisor on Renewable Energy with the National Farmers Union, but I'm a former academic in energy policy. Thanks. Beverly Gower Jones. I'm Managing Partner for Clean Growth Fund. Great. Great. So, um, three new participants, I think. Perhaps I'll start with you, Luke, and then we'll. Yeah. I just wanted to mainly pick up on the point made before about uh, people's participation yep. in all this. So we're very much focusing on developing new technologies in terms of energy generation. Um, so I work a lot to do with um, implementing AI um, in terms of climate change mitigation and how that is important in terms of resource efficiency. And therefore, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of developing new technologies for generation alongside technologies for efficiency essentially in how we go about using that energy mm -hmm. and therefore very much thinking about okay solar is generating more when the sun is shining we have wind and how that interacts with storage throughout the energy grid mm -hmm. i just wanted to emphasize the importance of using the technology becoming available more and more through the internet of things as we have more measurements throughout our homes and throughout the grids and just wanted to open up that side of the discussion on the demand side as well as the supply side of the energy Brilliant. Problem. Yeah, I've got a really geeky interest in the internet of things, so I'm sorry about this. Um, Beverly, can I come to you first and then over to you? Sure. Um, it just struck me that it was difficult to have this conversation without mentioning nuclear. Yeah. Um, it's a complete net zero energy source, especially with the web that Martin talked about in terms of distributed mm -hmm. energy. Um, and then of course, it has a um, you know kind of consistent um, base load, which we don't always get with uh, solar and, and wind. So I, I just felt as I was sitting listening that yeah. I couldn't let that pass without you know kind of um, talking about uh, nuclear fusion and also small modular reactors mm -hmm. and the role that you know that they will are needed and will, and will play in our kind of energy. Um, next going forwards. And just while, while we've got you, because we've got 35 minutes in and nuclear's only just popped up, um, just unpack small modular reactors a little bit more for us because not all of us will be aware of that technology. So. Sure, so it, it's um, uh, my, my actual uh, background is in terms of uh, financing technologies mm -hmm. rather than um, any kind of particular specialism in, uh, you know, in any one um, technology such as like nuclear, but Small modular reactors would um, have a kind of a seven year or so payback. Um, they, they're kind of due to, to be available in the next uh, four or so, three or four years, as I, as I um, understand it, and, and would be able to contribute to uh, the, energy, the energy generation at distributed places for um, heavy industry and for cities and, and so on. Um, and so therefore be kind of widely dispersed rather than, you know, the large kind of reactors that you see at the size of the world. Yeah. Thanks, Bradley. Brilliant. I, there were quite a few heads nodding, nodding vigorously when you jumped in, so if anybody wants to join in on that, please do. Jonathan. So, yeah, I'm, I have a sort of helicopter view of energy policy. I'm absolutely fascinated by this conversation. Mm -hmm. 
I think what's really interesting is we start seeing the different new energy options start to bump up against one another and a certain amount of fungibility. Patricia talked about fungibility, uh, I think, earlier introducing bioenergy because it is potentially easily fungible with many of the fossil fuels that we're trying to replace. But we've also got all sorts of interesting things that come up in discussion about long-term, short-term storage. And you know, if we're going to have electrolytic hydrogen, do we just leave it as hydrogen and make use of it as hydrogen, or can we turn it into other kinds of clever mole small molecules, ammonia, synthetic methane, and things like that, which then start to be fungible with other things that may come from bioenergy, mm. um, and perhaps actually help if you're trying to create new kinds of long distance transportation chains around the world. But then you come to something like solar, and people like Twiggy Forest at Fortescue Industries, who's got people handing out publicity here outside the uh, Queen Street um, station, uh, you know, this massive project in Northern Australia, which is going to be exporting electricity through um, 4,000 kilometres into Singapore. We've got a British version of that as well called x -Links, which is meant to be in southern Morocco and sending seasonally storable power into an, a grid injection point in Devon near Barnstable um, without going through the European supergrid. It will have its own private wire, as it were, 3,000 kilometers long. So, you know, there's so many possibilities bubbling up at the moment, uh, all jostling with one another. And actually what people out there are saying is that there's lots of money available. We just need to know where to invest it. Yeah. So we can have a conversation about that and, and try and direct how we build this new sustainable economy, which is going to have perhaps many fewer of the disadvantages of the old economy. Yeah, I haven't even thought about that. Just that whole Justin idea is really powerful. Can you had your hand up in something? Yeah, you know, I'd like to come in on th those are all really interesting topics. And starting with the, I'm really glad you mentioned about the artificial intelligence, because I think those types of, of technologies make us better at everything that we do, irrespective of which technology that we're dealing with, whether it be in the wave and tidal sector or offshore wind sector, where you're trying to then sort of you know, predict your resource assessment, or whether it be in the demand sector, even predicting how the consumer is, is going to behave. Everything makes this um, more efficient and more effective in making this a more affordable transition and a more just tra transition. Um, I'm also glad that you mentioned nuclear because irrespective of any of the future energy mixes that, that we look at predicted by the, um, by, by the national grid, irrespective of how high renewables they are, they all have nuclear within them with different levels of, of new nuclear that, that are there. Which then brings me to back to our previous statement about sort of how we deliver this and whether it be, you know, the storage that we have from, from, from Martin or in the electric vehicles that we also also heard about, you know, that is a very sort of, you know, that's at the localised level that is needed to make everything um, more resilient and more well balanced. But also, as, um, as Deborah was saying, is about sort of the overall energy mix being, being well balanced. And so making sure that you have um, wave and tidal offsetting the seasonal distribution of, of solar to make everything much, much better. And then when it comes to the, the overall policies about what we invest in, you know, it's a really big decision for UK energy policy makers, but it is a decision that needs to be made, and it needs to be made in a balanced way between economic policy, to what delivers a just transition and makes this affordable and has high quality jobs, while delivering energy policy at the least cost to, to the consumer, and both of those things need to be balanced to get, needs to be balanced together. Anyone that be speaking, um, and anybody else, please feel free to join on this. Um, I did want to, we've mentioned um, the role of the public a couple of times, and one of the topics I wanted to get into that you've just touched on, but you could perhaps kick us off in the next chapter of this conversation, is that just transition, and making sure that when it comes to um, delivering a net zero energy system to the public, we don't in some, somehow penalise, for example, lower income households. Um, thank you, Leslie. Um, so, um, have you got any thoughts on that? And then I'm going to ask you to leave, sir. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really I, 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 absolutely, I do, and, and absolutely, I, I, I will. I think it's the you know 
it, it's building on this the statement that I just made. It's mm -hmm. delivering, you know, sort of energy policy at least cost to the consumer. Yeah. You know, doing the right thing for the least cost energy system. Well, the same thing, doing the right thing for the overall UK economy. So making sure that there are high quality jobs associated with this. And mm -hmm. so the the decisions that the policymaker needs to make needs to make, and they do need to be made between between um, bays and they need to be made between treasury um, and there needs to be a balance between the two recognizing that you need to deliver net zero but at the same time delivering the just transition and i don't think that you'll do both of those things in isolation there needs to be uh um, decisions made to sort of pick winners and government doesn't have a problem with picking winners but they have a problem with picking losers <laughs> and so making that really difficult decision is i think the, the overall challenge to deliver energy policy and deliver just transition need to be linked together thank you thanks brilliant john i'll come to you and then we've got a new participant so i'll come to you next and then uh, yeah so look very much on that point it was a, it's partly in response to the point you were making earlier uh, about uh, engaging with consumers. Government is trying to make some decisions about do we go for heat pumps or do we go for hydrogen for home heating? And you know neither is particularly perfect solution. And one of the big problems is look at this from the point of view of the relatively poor householder who feels that, well, I'm gonna to be told to junk my gas boiler, maybe not directly, because Prime Minister says it will always be a choice that you can make, but you know, heavily pressured to swap it out and put in a heat pump instead. And yet, I know plenty of uh, people you can find online and so on who will say, I'm sorry, in lots of houses, heat pumps don't work. We've got Caroline Lucas saying, we're all in leaky teapots. Unless we can stop the teapots from leaking, then we can't have heat pumps. And what are we going to do instead of that? We're going to have hydrogen 100% in domestic households. I'm sorry, I'm very worried about that because I think it could be very bad for the deployment of hydrogen elsewhere in the economy if there were domestic accidents. Thanks, John. Retire that way. No, thank you. And thank you for leaky teapots. I live in one of those. I certainly identify with it. Right, I'm going to scoot around everybody in just a second, but um, you've not straight before. Do you yeah. want to give your name? Yeah, I'm Callum Watkins, and uh, I'm representing Glasgow Community Energy today. So uh, from the kind of just transition perspective, thinking about different actors and people who can participate in the energy system. Um, so we're all about democratizing energy. Mm -hmm. And because it's becoming more distributed anyway, more people are acting. I mean, I think we talked about millions of people are going to be involved in the energy system. How do we educate people? How do we tell them about why it's important? Um, maybe, uh, as Andy was saying, we'll, we'll put it in like weather forecasts, you know, every morning and say, right, here's what the weather's going to be. Here's what you should do, do with your energy. Um, and we want to be kind of part of that, that process and enabling people to really understand where their energy comes from, to own it, to be uh, voting and deciding with their money and with their their uh, their voice on how to use that energy. So I'm quite excited about this part of the discussion. About yeah, misery. brilliant. I love that. Um, yeah, part of the weather forecast, just like yeah. We back to Deborah saying, "Do your washing today. <laughs> it's a really good day for washing." <laughs> Fantastic. That's a lovely country. Sarah, I'll come to you, and then I'll come back to Mark. Okay, I'll try and. There's a few points to pick up on, so I'll yeah. try and remember them all. One is there's a Twitter field called the Baking Forecast, and it will tell you when to bake based on how much renewables is on the system. Um, the second one is um, impact on individuals isn't always a cost impact. So when we think about, uh, for example, investment in networks and where the networks are gonna go and how that's gonna be paid for, sometimes the impact is not on the community from a cost point of view, but an impact on their landscape, their social amenity, um, and so there are things other than cost when we think about the just transition, um, just putting that out there. And leaky teapots can be heated by anything. It's just not an efficient way to heat a leaky teapot. So heat pumps do work in leaky, in leaky teapots and so do gas boilers and so do hydrogen boilers, but it's better to insulate your leaky teapot first. Brilliant, thanks Sarah. I should have said I have a leaky teapot with a heat pump. <laughs> so good. Um, I'll give it to you, Mark, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, well, you've, you're talking about the just transition now, and I think we're reaching a real inflection point with that, because to date, most of the rejigging the energy system has been done at the big project level. So it's been about leveraging large amounts of capital into those through mechanisms which are understood by the players that understand it. And now we've got to 
you, there are two particular things which you're going to need the consumer to do it, and the consumer becomes a prosumer. First is heat, and the second is transport. And the issue for them is how do you get that to happen without it being regressive? So there is a need to find the capital or to create um, policy and business models which will bring it in. Because at the moment, if you look, just take transport. The only people who can afford the electric cars are those who are probably sitting in this sort of room. They're educated, they've got reasonable incomes, and they can do it. But we need everybody to have electric cars. And what's going to happen quite quickly is that the old fossil fuel cars are going to go into the second-hand market where the C's and D's can afford it, and then they're going to be suffering rising prices and increasingly draconian taxes on it. And so you're going to get regressive policies, which are supposedly the carrot and stick, but these people don't have the capital for it. So we're now facing this head on because you're moving away from the big projects. And I think it's going to be a crucial thing to get right if, A, we're going to get the speed in this, and B, you do not exacerbate um, a, sent a sentiment of inequality. Thanks, Martin. That's really well. I just want to really emphasize a couple of points that we made there recently about our, our primary objective should always be to reduce how much we're consuming. So the efficiency of our homes, you know, when we choose to travel and how we choose to travel, that should always, in the hierarchy of things, be, be the first thing. If our homes are more efficient, we don't need as much heat, we don't need as much energy. So just, just like to really emphasize that, that point. I appreciate this is a conversation about generation, but you know, we need less generation if we're more efficient in the first place. Yeah. And my, 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 my real point is, 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 on, is on the markets and the pricing and, and, and the, these, these kind of things. So I'll give you an example. Many of our electricity bills are mostly made up of through costs. You know, 60 to 70 percent of our, our electricity bills are, are fixed standing charges, not even related to consumption. You can never switch on a light and you're still paying these standard charges. So there really has to be a reversal in, 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 in the way we, we charge people and, um, and make people pay for, for their energy. So if you are transitioning from a gas boiler, for example, to a heat pump, great, it's good, it's good for the environment. It, 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 is, it is one of the, the things we should be aspiring to. That places increased financial pressure on the consumer because of the cost of electricity and the, the way that those electricity markets are structured in, 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 in the form of three charges and taxes and, and so forth. So we really need government intervention on that. In, in, um, you know, do we do we more heavily tax gas? <laughs> it's a really problematic thing. Do we subsidize electricity? Do we place more pressure on generators and, and, and um, suppliers? I, I don't know the answer to that, but just just a, a point about the, the cost of the relative fuels. Going on heat, heat pumps, just picking up that point. The problem you've got is a heat pump in winter. At best, it's going to be a, have, have a coefficient of performance of three. And when you have a, distant, a difference between uh, the cost of gas and the cost of electricity, which is about the same, then you spend all this money to put the heat pump in, but you get no benefit from the running costs. And that's what people are seeing. So there is a huge need to sort out that, that market. Then we come back to it, oh, time of use. Okay. And, and these kind of things. Yeah, so yeah. it's a very, very complicated thing. No, no, no.